Welcome back. We're going to be talking about chapter 11, which is going to be covering the role of chance in decision making and in events. So let's dive in and find out what we're talking about. Okay, so first thing I wanted to point out is that we all walk around sort of thinking, well, everybody's unique. I hear people on TV say all the time, well, since everybody's different, then obviously this treatment won't work for everybody. Or um, in the case of this little cartoon, this outfit won't fit everybody, um, you know, things like that. This cartoon is actually a really good depiction of the reality of how different we are from each other, which is that most of us are within a, a certain range of average, right? That's, that's sort of the definition of what the word average means, that there's, you know, a, an average score. Most of us cluster kind of around that average score. And then, you know, there are outliers, people who are farther away from average than the typical person is. And, and so this cartoon sort of illustrating that this person who's looking at this jacket is coming to the conclusion she's different from everybody else. She's an outlier. Everybody else clusters around that size, but it's not going to work for her. Um, and we all kind of walk around with that feeling that we're different. Um, we're unusual. We're unique. But then we also simultaneously kind of hold ourselves up as, well, you know, if I feel like this is true, it's probably probably lots of people feel like this is true, right? We, we discuss, we discuss the, the principle of humanity pre previously, this, this notion that we carry around with us, that if it's easy for us, it must be easy for them, right? Um, that, so we, we simultaneously kind of hold ourselves up as typical of the average person while also thinking of ourselves as sort of unique, right? Um, so psychology is sort of like, us. We, we acknowledge um, in psychology that people vary, that not everybody's going to agree on things or have the same attitudes on things and that not everybody's going to, you know, have color vision or not everybody's going to dream when they sleep or, you know, other kinds of things. We acknowledge that not everybody's going to be exactly the same, but we do emphasize the fact that most people are going to cl cluster around the mean. Okay, so that's really important for one of the things that we use in psychology, which is what we call actuarial prediction. Now, if you've ever heard the term actuarial before, it was probably in, in the context of insurance um, because actuarial um, statisticians are oftentimes employed by insurance companies uh, to help figure out what the most likely outcomes are for different kinds of people with regard to, you know, car accidents or lifespan or other kinds of things. So you may be familiar with the term actuarial with regard to insurance, but what the term really refers to is sort of taking the statistics, the averages into account. So psychology clearly is an actuarial field because we are um, going to say that the best prediction predictor of future behavior is your past behavior. So if I know you and I know that on average, you tend to be late whenever we meet each other, I'm going to assume that on this instance, you're probably going to be late again, because the best predictor of your future behavior is actually what you've done in the past in similar situations. So if I know you, I can look at your past behavior and I can make a really good prediction of how you're likely to behave right now. Now, you as the person who is late to meet me typically, you know why you're late and you feel like it's not really a pattern that's about you. You feel like, well, it's traffic or it's, you know, other roadblocks that got in your way, but that's you using a different kind of prediction. Um, you're, you're using what we call clinical prediction. Um, when trying to predict the behavior of someone we know, their best, the best predictor of what they're likely to do in this circumstance is what they have done in the past in similar circumstances. Psychology kind of takes that mindset. But in psychology, unless you're a clinical psychologist, you probably don't know the participants in your research study, right? You probably have never met them before. So that's when we have to acknowledge another component of actuarial prediction, which is that the average behavior is much more likely to occur than outlying behavior is. So when I'm confronted with a person who I don't know, and I don't know what their, what their 
idiosyncratic response might be. So I can't base my prediction on their individual past behavior. I can look to averages for people like them. And that's the big principle of psychological research. We don't know all the humans in the world. And so we can't, um, you know, track all of the things that they have done up till this point to help us to predict what they're likely to do going forward. But what we can do instead is use average people, people who are like the person who we're trying to model and use their behavior to predict what a person like them is likely to do. So my favorite non-psychological example that I keep bringing up across this class. Let's look at climate modeling. I'm going to insert here any model where we're trying to predict future outcomes. So there are other things, you know, that are going on right now at the time that I'm recording this lecture that would also fall under this idea of modeling, right? So the blue jaggedy line is it's labeled instrumental record that those are the known temperatures that have occurred in the past um, and they're average temperatures for each of the years that are represented there so you see that the blue line is you know up and down up and down some years are warmer and some years are colder um, and that on average the line is kind of going up and to the right so if we were to draw a line through it that line would be not a flat line it would be going up to the right all right, and then what we see to the to the right of that blue line is um, some models. So the solid red line you'll notice is overlapping the blue jaggedy line. Um, what they're doing with that red line is averaging across an 11 year cycle. So you'll see that the red line is a much smoother depiction of temperatures from the past than the blue line is because it's averaging across. And so what you see is that there are some periods of time where it is pretty flat. It still has some peaks and valleys across it and it is going up to the right rather than staying flat. So even the 11 year cycle um, that's taking into consideration the, the temperatures that have happened in the past, it is going up to the right. Okay, so that's all the information that we have. Like these are the, these are the knowns. Off to the right are the projections. And so there are different projections there. You've got um, the red dotted line, assuming that we should use the, the minimum temperature across 11 years as the predictor. Um, the solid pink line is we should just use the averages for the 11 year cycle and um, predict from that. We have the pink dashed line, which is the grand minimum, again, using a different model. And then uh, we have our our little projections. And so what you're seeing is that the lines are going up and to the right much more steeply than the past measurements have been, right? That's the important thing that I want you to get from this picture is that we have data. We have the past behavior of the climate occurring in the blue line and the solid red line that's overlapping it. And we're using that information to predict what is likely to happen in the future. Now, what is most likely to happen in the future following actuarial prediction is that um, average behavior, you know, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior and average behavior is more likely than outlying behavior. So I drew a green line using what's called the line of best fit, where the green line is equidistant from the highs and the lows going across this pattern, right? And so if we follow that green line out, just following the pattern that it's been on, um, you'll notice my green line is significantly lower than any of the projected models, right? Um, I thought I'd give the maybe a slightly different angle when if we said, well, let's just average since 1980. I don't know why we would randomly pick 1980 out of all of um, human history or industrialization or whatever, but let's pick 1980. And then I cast it off at that angle. And you see that now that line is steeper, but it's still not where the models are predicting. The models are predicting based on not just the previous behavior of the climate. The models are predicting based on estimations of how many more people will have cars in the world, how many more countries are going to start having an industrialization that might include burning of fossil fuels for energy and a whole bunch of other things, right? Like it's taking a lot of other things besides just previous climate data into account. And that's how you're getting those, those much steeper lines. But what would actuarials tell us about that? Actuarials would say the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, right? So the best predictor of future climate should be past climate. 
And, you know, past climate isn't that far ago. Like the picture that I've got here ended with data from 2015. We even have data now up to 2019. So we could actually extend this out a couple more years and see if our, our line needs to be at a different angle or something. But um, the issue is that, that what we have is what has happened in the past. That's what we can rely on. Um, average behavior is much more likely than outlying behavior. So that that 11 year cycle makes a lot of sense. Let's average across five years or, or 11 years or something like that and use those average scores to predict the future, right? Because those average scores are more likely to be repeated than outlying scores would be. Okay, now I'm not a climatologist, so I'm not trying to suggest that um, my lines are better. I'm just saying that um, using climate change as an example, um, of what we mean by actuarial prediction, we should have actually different predictions if we were gonna use actuarial prediction. Instead, they're doing a different kind of analysis, a lot more clinical prediction, and we'll get to that in a little bit. So, most research in psychology describes average behavior. It's one of the things that sometimes annoys people in other fields, like sociology or other fields that look at psychology and they say, but you know, what about the individual? Um, psychology is very interested in average behavior of, you know, people of certain kinds, right? So we may want to know what the average woman thinks about this, or the average college student thinks about that or does, or, you know, what the average sleeper experiences or whatever it is, right? We're looking at averages. Why are we focused on the average? Well, if we focus in on individuals, we might get misleading information because it's possible that the individual's behavior is not representative of the typical person. And so if we read about an individual, who sleeps this way or thinks that way, we may incorrectly believe that that individual represents a lot of people. When it, and maybe even you should be more like that individual, right? When in fact, that person's behavior is very much in the minority and not many people have the same attitudes or sleep habits or whatever. And you absolutely shouldn't be um, saying anything about what you should be doing based on what this individual is doing. So we've got, you know, like the group, I like the, they're all wearing be yourself t-shirts while the one person is, is actually off doing their own thing. If we interview the one shirtless person, we might get a misinterpretation of what the average person thinks because everybody else is over here wearing their be yourself shirt. So we want to make sure that we in psychology are understanding um, typical behavior because um, it's, this is the study of human behaviors and mental processes, not um, shirtless guy on the right's um, behaviors and mental processes. All right, so we we don't wanna um, accidentally draw too much inference from you know a, a, an individual's behavior because it might be the minority. We also use average behavior because if we have an individual who we're studying, they may realize that you know we're studying them and as a result, they might actually change their behavior so as not to fulfill the prophecy, right? So if they're aware that we're expecting them to behave in a certain way, uh, they may actually behave abnormally for them, right? Out of character for them, just for the purposes of the study so that they can show us that our predictions are wrong. So if, for example, you know that you're at risk for a certain disorder or something like that, you might take preventative steps. You might go buy an ounce of prevention, right? To make sure that you don't actually end up with the outcome that's pr predicted. Um, so we might in psychology call this overcompensation, right? Where a person knows that there are certain expectations for people like them and they may do everything in their power to ensure that that prediction doesn't come true. And so if we're, if we're working with an individual like that, we may get an incorrect impression of, you know, ac average behavior or typical behavior. All right, now this is probably the most challenging thing in actuarial prediction. We have to accept the fact that we're gonna be wrong for certain individuals in order to reduce the error overall when predicting the average. So we must accept error in order to reduce error. So when we do research in psychology, we know that we're not describing every single person. We know that. We know that we're going to describe some people. But overall, our prediction is going to be better than if we were to just study an individual. We'd only be able to explain that one person, 
Instead, with this approach, with this actuarial approach where we're focusing in on averages, we're going to be right for the majority of people and wrong for a very small subset. So I thought it would be fun if we illustrated this concept with the let's make a deal um, that we played before. And this time I'm using a slightly different uh, emulator, I think it's referred to. <laughs> so um, I'm going to use the same procedure that I did before. But I think I'll start with the three this time and work the other direction just because I started with one last time. So we'll start with three this time. I'm going to do 10 trials where I stay every time. And I'm going to do 10 trials. You know what? I don't need to because I already established that concept. I'm just going to do 20 trials of switching. Because I've done tw I've done 10 trials of switching in a previous video. So if you haven't seen that video, go back and watch chapter 1. Is it chapter 2? Hmm. I should know my chapters better. I'm going to start with number 3. And as you guys recall, I pick a door. It opens one of the two doors and I have the option to stay or switch. I'm always going to take the option to switch. Ooh, I moved off of the car. I had a loss. That's disappointing. Okay, so let's play again. Dang, I lost on the first one. Well, that's a drag. All right. Switch every time. Ooh, I won. Yay. I need a piece of paper to keep track of my my winnings here. Um, so I switch every time. Ooh, I lost again. Oh, that's so painful. Okay. But I'm going to stick with it because I have to accept error in order to succeed overall. My best, my, as we established in the earlier lecture, the best strategy is to switch. Okay. So now I'm like even again. I'm two and two. I do need something to keep track of this with. So I've got two wins, two losses. I'm switching on every one. Okay, I won again. Whew. All right, so now I am three wins to two losses. Ooh, four wins to two losses. Okay, now I'm going to take a moment. I'm, I've got four wins to two losses. If you recall, the prediction is that you will win twice as often if you switch than if you stay. So I have to accept the fact that sometimes I'm going to lose. Ooh, not this time. Okay, that's five to two. Ooh, six to two. Why is it so rewarding to be on the car? It's the weirdest little, I go, oh, I won, right? All right, so I think I lost count, but I think it's seven to two. <laughs> oh, I lost. So I think it's seven to three. Oh, you originally picked our three. Here's a summary of how previous contestants have fared. Okay, that's not me though. Okay, so it doesn't keep track of mine. Okay, I think I'm seven to three. Ooh, seven to four. All right, seven to, uh, eight to five. All right, I'm going to take a moment to editorialize again, eight to five. Um, if you recall, the premise is that you have a 33% chance of selecting the correct door in the first place. And so there's a two third chance that the, that the correct answer is under one of the other doors, right? Um, so when you pick this one, I've picked door number three as I have been this whole time. Um, that means there was a 33% chance of it being right, a 66% chance of it being one of the other two doors. Um, switching, they've eliminated the door number one. Switching to two should give me um, double the probability of being right. Okay, so now I'm on nine to four or five. <laughs> no, I'm the worst. Uh, Ten. Eleven. I think I'm on 11 to 5, 12 to 5, 13 to 5, 14 to 5, okay, one more, 
15 to 5. So actually, I won three quarters of the time. One of my reasons why I wanted to redo this is not just because I wanted to show you that I have to accept some error. I missed five times. You can't always be right, but you're going to be right more often if you follow an actuarial procedure. One of the reasons why I wanted to do this again, since I did already show it to you guys once before, is that I wanted to try it from the other side, right? If I always start with one and then switch, is, is it somehow the case that the computer algorithm is setting it up so that, you know, moving off of one, you have a better chance of winning than if you move off of three or something, right? So by moving with three onto something else, I've established that it's not um, somehow set up in the in the computer program to do it. It really is the case that no matter how it's set up, whether it's you deal out cards or however you want to do it, um, you actually have at least double the chance of winning if you switch. I had to face some failures though, didn't I? I had to take some error along the way, sticking with that, with that switching procedure, even in the face of feedback where I was wrong, um, was the strategy that actually led to the best outcome in the long run. Had I started sort of saying, oh no, I got punished for that switch, I'm gonna stay a couple of times, um, I actually would have reduced my success in the long run. And so we have to accept error in order to, in the long run, reduce error. So for any one individual in our sample, we may be incorrect, but for the average person in the sample, we're going to be collecting data that is correct. So knowing that, that we have to reduce error, we have to accept error in order to reduce error. Why are people, like not researchers, but people, so motivated to really not ever be wrong, you know, to avoid all errors? For one thing, we don't like being wrong. I mean, I was just doing a stupid goat and car thing and it was the weirdest little flutter I would get every time I saw the car <laughs> and sort of that sinking dough feeling you get when you get a goat right? We don't like being wrong. So of course we see that in, we see evidence of that in, in the fact that people follow the confirmation bias, right? They look for evidence that they're right and ignore evidence that they might be wrong. We just don't like being wrong, even if it's something meaningless, like whether you've picked the right door on a computer emul emulator that isn't giving you anything. I didn't get a car. I didn't get a goat. I just got to see a picture of it. We just don't like to be wrong. Losing is very punishing. And I put losing in quotation marks because of course in research, we're not losing. And in a lot of things in our lives, we're not losing. It's just, you know, being wrong feels punishing. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't fulfill our, you know, view of ourselves as people who are understanding how the world works. We're processing information correctly to be, to, to be provided with evidence that we're wrong is, a bit of a slap in the face or cold water thrown in your face, right? It, it's very punishing. It's like, wait, I thought I understood how this was working. How, how am I, how am I getting the wrong, how am I getting a goat? I thought I understood how this is going. So we avoid error in order to avoid that feeling of punishment where we have to accept that possibly we are misrepresenting the world in our minds. So Let's pretend like we're hiring an accountant. So let's all pretend like we're on the hiring committee um, and we have to select a new chief accountant. No one in the firm's accounting office is qualified for the job. So we have to go outside the firm to find our new chief accountant. The job requirements were expertise and practical experience in accounting, organizational skills, and the ability to get along with and to lead other people. There were two candidates for the job, Mr. Simpson and Mr. Barker. Each, so these are their similarities, their overlap. Each had worked for a small firm previously, and they had about the same amount of experience in accounting. Both had letters of recommendation from two former employers, and you, the personnel, the personnel manager, personally knows all the employers and trusts their judgment. So I want you to think about that, that, you know, it's an accounting world and you know other accountants. And so you know this person, you know the people who have written the letters of recommendation for the applicants. And so you feel very confident that the things that are in the letters are accurate. Okay, let's start with Mr. Simpson. Both letters on Mr. Simpson indicated that he was an excellent accountant and that his organizational skills, which include delegation of responsibility, regulation of paper flow, meeting deadlines, were fairly good. One letter said he was an, a fairly effective leader, but he did not get along with several members of his staff, and in fact, some actively disliked him. 
The other letter also expressed some fairly strong reservations about his ability to get along with the staff, but not about his leadership ability. Both letters on Mr. Barker indicated that he was an excellent accountant and that his organizational skills were quite good. Both letters stressed that he was an excellent leader and that he got along extremely well with almost all st staff members. The personnel manager, that's you, interviewed both men and introduced them to the 12 member accounting staff at a half hour get acquainted session. Mr. Simpson seemed quite impressive, obviously intelligent, energetic, and good humored. He made a very solid impression on the, on the personnel manager, you, and on most of the staff members. Mr. Barker did not make such a good impression either on the personnel manager or on the staff. He seemed intelligent enough, but somewhat ill at ease and awkward. Most of the staff wondered how easy he would be to get to know and to communicate with. All right, so that's your setup. Which candidate should you pick and why? And what are the most important things to take into consideration? So normally I'd like to give you guys a little bit of time to sort of talk about it and share ideas and stuff like that, but we're online, so we'll pretend like that happened. And what I would like to attract your attention to is which kind of information you should rely on. Should you rely on the letters of recommendation or should you rely on the get to know you session, the half hour get to know you session that each candidate experienced? A lot of times we want to focus on our personal experience, right? We have that thought in our mind that, you know, maybe in the past, Mr. Simpson hadn't gotten along with his coworkers because maybe they just, you know, were not well suited to each other. And that, you know, I'm trying to hire somebody who is going to get along with the people who are here. And maybe he's our cup of tea. Like maybe he wasn't a good fit in the previous places, but he's, he does fit in here. And so maybe we should look at our own personal experience with him and emphasize that more heavily. But what I would like to argue is that more data is always better than less data, right? So if we have two letters of recommendation that are both based on months or years of experience with these candidates, we should weigh that more heavily than our half hour get to know you session with each candidate. Even if we believe in our, our heart of hearts that, you know, maybe the, the difficulties Mr. Simpson had was because of, you know, a mismatch of personalities in that setting, we should not let our personal experience in 30 minutes override the years or months of experience that are being represented by those letters. So, more data is better. Actuarial reasoning is better. So we should, we should basically discard our own personal opinions based on 30 minutes because anyone can fake it for 30 minutes. Anyone can be nice for 30 minutes or, or whatever. And it's possible that Mr. Barker is just shy. You know, isn't he just sort of fulfilling the stereotype of an accountant by being sort of ill at ease and, and awkward in a social setting where there are 13 people there and um, and he knows he's up for an interview. And I mean, how, how do you not expect him to act like that? So maybe we should be suspicious about Mr. Simpson having such a gregarious personality, right? Um, we should always put more emphasis on the, the information that is based on more data and less emphasis on the information that's based on less data. All right, I'm going to stop there. And in the next segment, we will start talking about clinical prediction.